And there is King Crow finishing up Folding Paper Dreams off of their new disc, The Persistence. And before that, you heard King Crow off of their very first disc from about 15 years ago now. Uh, Maybe even more. I could probably go double check that, but it ain't worth it. It was a long time ago, by my perspective, and the song was Never Say Die. So some older primitive King Crow and some newer, very polished King Crow. Unfortunately, I don't know that they're going to be touring the States anytime soon. So really listening to their CDs is the only way to do it, which is sad. Well, it's a little bit later in the hour than I'd anticipated. But anyway, let's take a quick break from music here. And let's go sneak into Ken's Dark Corner where I'm going to tell you about horror films that I like to watch. This week's episode is called 27 Cameras. It is close enough to the top of the hour that what the heck, I'll just do this now. This is Ken the Metal Professor. You're listening to WVLP, Valparaiso's one and only nonprofit community radio station here in Valparaiso, Indiana. This is that time of year where we're looking at the WVLP pocketbook. And as a consequence of doing that experiment, making sure to tell everybody that we are always on the lookout for new underwriting and new sponsors. So if you're listening to WVLP, What you can do is go find WVLP on Facebook. It's really easy, and there is a click to donate button there. Or if you want something more substantial, say you're a business owner in the area, and you like the idea of having your business mentioned several times per week, and also perhaps in a very specific show, like mine or others, in a NPR kind of way, not commercials, but being mentioned as a supporter of Valparaiso Community Radio, you can do that too. You can get in touch with me at metalprofessor.com, metalprofessor at gmail.com, or check out the station directly, info at wvlp.org, or 476-9000. Let's hope that uh, 2019 will be a year that WVLP gets through, thanks to generous support from our supporters and underwriters. This is Ken's Dark Corner, starting about 10 minutes later than I would like to, but hopefully it will be about 10 minutes shorter than it was the last time I did it. It's episode 11, and it's called 27 Cameras. This is my little interlude in between heavy metal, where I talk about horror movies. Crossover audiences are pretty common, I think, between heavy metal and horror, and so it's a good fit. Why is this episode called 27 Cameras? Well, you know when you're on Netflix and you're browsing through the different selections And it has all these rows that say, because you watched this, we're going to show you all these other titles that you might like as well, based on whatever uh, analytics that they happen to use. And every once in a while, some movie comes around where you're just not interested. It doesn't look that great. But the dang thing just keeps showing up over and over and over. And eventually you just surrender. And you're like, oh, my gosh, Netflix. Okay, I'll watch the dang thing. Well, I... uh, I was not going to do that with this movie until I noticed that this particular movie now has a sequel, which is also popping up in the Netflix suggested views. And so I decided, well, if I don't want to have to look at these suggestions anymore, then I've probably just got to watch the dang things. And so the movies are uh, 13 cameras from 2015 and 14 cameras from 2018. And you do the math and boom, you've got 27 cameras. So what's going on in these movies? Well, they're not really horror movies, but they are kind of creepy movies. It's about this uh, creepy dude who installs hidden cameras in a house that he rents or in the second movie is doing sort of an Airbnb type of thing with. And the events that follow because he is uh, peeping on them. So in the first movie, he's peeping on this family, which is uh, which is. Uh, Sorry, not a whole family, but a newlywed couple, uh, which is expecting a baby, and they've moved into this particular house. I guess the subtitle of 27 Cameras could be, uh, I'm watching the 27 Cameras so that you don't have to, because I feel a little bit let down by Netflix suggesting these things to me. In the first movie, the setup is, you know, a a pretty typical horror movie kind of setup. The main characters, oh my gosh, they are boring. They're 
characters are boring. They lead boring lives. Even the landlord guy is, other than his physical creepiness, he's boring. There's nothing interesting uh, going on. As part of this movie, a part of the intrigue that shows up, this guy who's in this newlywed couple happens to have been having an affair with a friend of theirs for a while. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, who would have an affair with this boring guy? He's boring. But anyway, the movie drags on and on with these boring people doing boring things and not leading interesting lives until Mr. Creepy who's if i have to say one good thing about these movies it's that the guy playing a landlord is genuinely creepy he does a really good job he's got awful skin he hobbles around he's a mouth breather (sighs) that breathes through his mouth he hardly ever speaks a word he looks like he hasn't bathed in a long time so that was spot on i wouldn't want to be around that guy but the rest of it yeah uh just way too many what the heck kind of moments and things that just don't make sense but He's been spying on these people, trying to get his jollies, but there aren't that many jollies to be had. And he gets to learn about this affair that the dude's been having. And at one point, he's over there in the house, and he's checking on his equipment or doing something, and the affair lady comes over to the house. And so he uh, grabs her, and it turns out that he has a basement room in this house where he gets to keep her. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, there's people living in this house. How does he have a basement room? Well, there is a door in a hallway, which is discovered by the newlywed couple, which is normally locked, but they find it unlocked once, and there's a staircase going down. But they don't investigate going down the staircase. They just figure it belonged to this other guy. So they don't investigate it any further. I don't know. If I was living in a house and I discovered a basement, I might go down there and check it out. And if they did check it out, it was a very cursory checkout that that I didn't pay. I'll I'll admit, I was kind of starting to look at my phone at this point in the movie anyway. Um, But what's more interesting about this basement is that it has the best soundproofing of any building I've ever seen because he has this woman that he's kidnapped in the basement of this very house. And at some point she's screaming and screaming and screaming and the people upstairs in the house can't hear her because this guy apparently did such a spectacular job of of, uh, soundproofing the room. So things go downhill from there and eventually uh, I think the boyfriend dies and at the end of the movie the creepy landlord dude um, makes off with the lady of the newlywed couple and apparently uh, steals her kid when it's born. So the very end of that movie, and this is, yes, it's a spoiler, but like I said, I I watch these so that you don't have to. uh, He drives off into the sunset with a little kid in a car seat at the end of that movie. So it turns out that this little kid was that was probably a jump forward in time and this little kid was actually born uh, while the woman was in captivity and in the next movie you do find out that that's actually the case so why is it 13 cameras i don't know the number 13 never actually plays a role in this movie and in both uh, the movie 13 and 14 cameras i think that there were some inconsistencies in the different viewpoints of the cameras in the second movie there's a pool outside the house Actually, there's one outside the house. They're different houses, but there's one outside the house in the first movie, too. In the second movie in particular, it looks like you get to see this pool through the lenses of these cameras from about four or five different directions at various different points. And I'm thinking if the guy has 14 cameras now, I don't know why that many of them would be trained on the pool. But it's kind of hard to tell because the movie doesn't commit to the whole camera thing. There are some movies like Paranormal Activity that I talked about a few weeks ago or the last time I did this, perhaps. It's been so long, I don't remember. Um, Paranormal Activity commits. You watch the entire movie through the cameras that are recording this action, where in this movie, you bounce back and forth between the Hollywood viewpoint of us watching these characters and the viewpoint of the cameras that this guy has put in the house. And it's not always immediately clear which one you're watching. So it kind of becomes hard to really zoom in on, you know, which, what the camera views are. At one point in the second movie, uh, even though there are 14 cameras and there are 14 television screens in his little viewing room, which you can see and count, they have a scene where he's on a computer screen, which is all ASCII text, and he's like toggling to the hallway, click, and now he sees the hallway, the bathroom, click, now he sees the bathroom. And if he's already got 14 screens dedicated to these cameras, why does he have to toggle through separate rooms in the house on his little ASCII text text control screen? I don't know, and they don't explain why. 
But there really is no rhyme or reason to why there's that many cameras. They just, you know, if you're making up a horror movie and you're not going to put 666 in the title and you're not going to put the number seven in the title, then apparently number 13 is the next best thing. Now, in the second movie, uh, this guy has an Airbnb type house. This family comes out there, the two parents, a son and daughter and a friend of the daughter. And he starts creepily following them. The second movie is actually better than the first one, which is kind of strange in sequels. Um, And one of the other aspects is that it's clear that in the second movie, he's part of some sort of, you know, dark web sort of video stream sharing where he's broadcasting the video streams that he's recording. And he starts getting offers of like, you know, how much for uh, an article of the, the girl's clothing that they were just watching. Um, and somebody offers him like $500 for it. So he has to sneak into the house and go and go steal something. Uh, later in the movie, somebody asks how much for the girl herself. And he starts getting offered like 10,000 or a hundred thousand dollars. So that, that dark web aspect of it was actually kind of interesting and more creepy than anything else that happened. Um, but this movie, again, the, the characters, I guess, are a little bit more interesting The landlord guy is a little bit more interesting. The story becomes a little bit more focused and refined. So if you're going to watch one or the other, just watch the second one. But there's still a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't make sense. So in the second movie, you learn that a boy that is now living with this landlord guy at his house, and the kid looks like he's 10 years old. So if this is the kid from the first movie, which they suggest that it is, uh, that means 10 years has passed between the two movies. And that just makes no sense based on the timeline of the movie's or how much older he does or does not look than the previous movie. In fact, the actor looks exactly three years older than he did in the first movie. Uh, In the second movie, you learn that the woman from the newlywed couple in the first movie, he's held her prisoner in an underground bunker out in the desert, you know, like a nuclear bomb shelter where there's a hatch in the ground and you have to go down a stairwell to get into the basement. And during the second movie, he kidnaps another woman and puts her down in there with the first girl the first woman. And as she's going down, it's clear that she is descending this ladder into total darkness. And for the rest of the movie, though, the two people in this bunker are able to see each other. We're able to see them. They're able to talk to each other and do stuff. But there's no indication of where the heck this light is coming from in the first place. So that was kind of weird. Um, So the first movie is really, really awful. The second movie is marginally better but it's still not that great. And so my conclusion for you is that between the 13 cameras and 14 cameras, these 27 cameras should be seen by zero eyes. But um bump. All right, that's that's Ken's Dark Corner. I've saved you three hours in total. That was Ken's Dark Corner. (laughs) That's my phone going off because I had to do something uh, during my time here in the studio. So I set an alarm to make sure that I wouldn't forget you hear that? <laughs> and I've already done it. But the joke's on me. I already did the thing that the alarm was supposed to remind me about. So at that point, I'll say the alarm was supposed to remind me to shut up and play more music. And so my phone is still talking to me. So I'm going to play you some more music. This is going to be all cheesy power metal. If you don't like it, uh, turn the volume down, but come back in about 15 or 20 minutes for the Northwest Indiana Wrestling Action Program, where you hear the audio recap of last weekend's show Invictus, put on by New Generation Wrestling down in Crawfordsville. Um, this first song you're going to hear should be Rhapsody of Fire, but the uh, total time that I'm seeing on the CD player tracker isn't long enough to include all the songs that I think is supposed to be in this set. So you're going to hear something. Dang if I know what it is. 